Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. What is up, everyone? I am your host, Charlie Shrem, and you're listening and watching another epic episode of The Charlie Shrem Show, powered by Waxman, where together, you and I, every week, we get to dive deep with some of Bitcoin and crypto's most influential leaders, OGs, those who are really, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> influential leaders, OGs. I've been talking so much this, this past weekend. I was in this whole finance seminar uh, in, in California. It was, it's been crazy. But we talked to all the people who who bring us all together, who are leading this industry forward, those who are not afraid to speak out and talk about what's happening and how we need it to change. There's a lot going on this week, huge amount that went on last week in our industry. This is the time. It's like Gandhi said or whoever said it. First, they ignore you. Then they laugh at you. Then they fight you. And then then you win. And I mean, the while the rest of the world has been embracing Bitcoin and crypto on such a massive scale from, from Europe to Dubai and, and all over the world, it seems like the U.S. is still like fighting this war simultaneously back to back going after Coinbase and Binance. It's been crazy. But I like what I like to do on this show is we, 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 we talk about, as you guys know, the positivity and the growth in the industry, the things that are happening, uh, what's been building, how we've been connecting Web 2 and Web 3, how we're going to change the way that we've been doing things for the past decade, two decades, three decades, and how we're doing it in the future and have fun along the way. I'm really excited today. We have an amazing guest, Fred Teal. You're the CEO of Marathon Digital, Marathon Digital Holdings. You guys are, are uh, one of the most famous companies in the industry right now. Uh, you're traded on NASDAQ as M-A-R-A. People go around, they're, they, they're called Mara Heads and they, they love talking about the company. And so, had you heard that term before? No, I've never heard of a Mara. One of my oh, one of my friends is like a top like you guys have fan clubs all over the world because you seem to have been embracing uh this Bitcoin uh purism, especially by being one of the top miners in the space right now. How does that make you feel? Uh, I mean, we're very proud of the opportunity to do what we do, which is secure the Bitcoin network and provide the service that we do to all of the people that rely on Bitcoin and want to make Bitcoin. Uh, you know, the ultimate uh, hard money that it, it could be. So we're very happy to do that. Um, we really love what we do. We think being focused on only Bitcoin is a way to stay uh, really true to what we're doing and be the best in the world at what we are. And uh, you know, we're very focused on truly going global and doing this on a global scale and bringing Bitcoin mining to all sorts of places where there's stranded energy. Explain that term, stranded energy. So... Um, if you think about the energy grid, it's like plumbing and it can't store energy, it can't hold it. And so unless you're pulling electrons out of the plugs in your wall, uh, there's no place for the energy to go in to the grid. And so you have all these energy generators, you have nuclear power plants, coal powered plants, natural gas plants, and then you have solar, wind and hydro. And essentially what happens is the grid is constantly trying to balance the utilities are trying to balance the amount of electricity going in and that going out. But there's a lot of electricity that doesn't get used um, because electrical demand uh, varies during the day. You have a peak at 9 a.m. in the morning, and then there's a lull from kind of 10 to 3 p.m., and then it peaks again in the afternoon. And so people that are generating energy in the, after in the middle of the day and early afternoon, they can't sell that energy sometimes. And so it's stranded. Or there isn't transmission lines, meaning those high-power tension cables that connect solar farms and wind farms to the grid haven't been built yet. And so those guys can't sell the energy. So we go and locate our Bitcoin miners next to where there's stranded energy that can't be sold. And we absorb it. We act like a customer of last resort, kind of imagine you're selling fruit in, this, in a uh, farmer's market and it comes to be noon and the farmer's market's about to close. Are you going to throw that fruit away or are you going to sell it for the lowest possible dollar? So we're kind of that customer of last wow. resort. Someone we're buying that last energy. It's like you can you can start a whole business called secondhand donuts where you just go around the donut shops at night and they throw them away. Yep. So you just get all the free donuts. That's very that's a very interesting business model. Yeah, so it, it's it's a way to it does a couple of things. One is it gives the energy producers who are the last ones to sell their energy because either their price is too high or um they're uh, intermittent. So solar and wind are typically the last energy to get turned on by the grid and they're the first to get turned off because of the fact that they're intermittent. 
And so for them to operate profitably, they either have to sell at a premium price when they can sell, or they partner with a Bitcoin miner like ourselves, and then they can sell energy to us when the grid doesn't need the energy. And when the grid does need the energy, we can shut down our miners and the grid can receive the energy. This does two things. One is it provides balance to the grid um, in the sense that uh, when the grid needs extra demand, say it's a really hot day in Texas, the sun's shining, a lot of AC is running, we yeah. can shut down our miners and all the energy we were using can now go to the grid. They don't have to go turn on new power plants or anything like that. Uh, and so we act as a balancer in that way, which is a great service to the grid. It seems to me that what you're doing is acting uh, as a battery holder, as a way to store energy in a more efficient way than like storing it in a battery, because you're storing it as Bitcoin units, which yes. are essentially the costs are valued at the cost because energy is probably one of the only last decentralized things in the world. And then you can set up a Bitcoin miner anywhere and then join the network in a permissionless way. You don't need permission like proof of stake. You need and eventually to join that network, you need to buy a token, which you need permission from all the other someone is, needs to sell that to you. So so in here you guys are taking this this system and you're like acting as a battery that can be maybe even moved. So why why wouldn't uh, governments or even like the state of Texas themselves start mining Bitcoin? It seems like it's the best way to preserve their especially the, in, in the state of Texas where you where you have a standalone grid. Well, it's a little more complicated than that because it's very capital intensive. I mean, it's you know, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars to build these large Bitcoin mining sites. Um, and if there are commercial enterprises that are willing to make that investment and provide the service, it's a way to achieve the same outcome with no capital outlay for the utility or for the government. So the alternative for a, a large solar farm or wind farm, for example, is to buy lots of batteries. Now that's capital, the solar and wind farm has to pay out and they then have to get that money back by selling electricity at premium prices to their customers, or they just partner with us and we provide the exact same service to the grid with no capital outlay by the power generator. And so it's much more symbiotic. You, uh, I've, I've been a Bitcoin purist my whole life. I've been in the industry for, since I've been a kid. So like 13, 14 years now. And to me, whenever someone has has gone over the environmental side of Bitcoin, I've always just explained, but hey, I believe Bitcoin as a value proposition to the world is worth is worth the cost to mine Bitcoin because we're creating a whole new financial system. And critics argued that, you know, so two things I would have to, you know, explain to them. I would have to like explain to them that one, Bitcoin is amazing. But two, and then get into the whole Bitcoin mining thing, and it's a very large, you know, high bar. But what you've done now is you've taken, you've taken the the environmental cause and you've turned it on its head, and you've used it as it's like not only are we not using energy and taking it away from hospitals and schools, but we're helping balance the grid, save money in the long term, uh, but at the same time. The Bitcoin mining industry has been building out hydroelectric dams and all these uh, plants that are doing like power in the most efficient and environmentally friendly way. Because what other industry, if ever, has had their like financial incentive to have cheap and efficient and more environmentally friendly power? Like what other industry? Uh, so you broke up there at the, at the very end of your question when you oh, said. No. no, I was more like just excited. I was saying what, oh. other industry, <laughs> what other industry has done more for the environmental cause than the Bitcoin mining industry? Uh, yeah, you know, there really isn't another industry that's able to do what we do because um, the al only alternatives you have uh, are really large battery farms, uh, to your point, uh, or large capacitors of some other yeah. form. Uh, so it, it's very unique. The, the fact that we consume energy uh, does a couple of other positive things. We create an incentive for the development of more solar and wind energy because we provide essentially a source of revenue for them. 
if you're going to build a solar farm or a wind farm today, and if we're as a country going to get to net zero energy by 2050, we need lots of transmission lines. We need lots of interconnect, which is how you connect these solar and wind farms to the grid. We are woefully behind in that. Uh, it's about a two to four year backlog if you're going to build a really? solar farm to get it connected to the grid. So there's no way for them to finance their projects. Now, if they have a customer like us who can co-locate next to their wind or solar farm, they can get the project finance. And so now they can build it. And then when the grid transmission connects, they can then start selling energy to the grid and providing that service. But until then, there's no economic viability for that project. So it's a really important nuance in the industry that Bitcoin miners can act as this initial baseload customer for renewable energy sources, get them financed, get these projects built so that the only thing missing is the interconnect. A big Did challenge in the US is that this interconnect cost, you know, it's basically $2 million a mile to build these cables. And uh, just over the next two years, the backlog of projects that exist is a cost in the hundreds of billions of dollars of interconnect. And question is, who's going to finance that? So, well, I mean, these are all like not bad problems. You're talking about like there's more demand than there is supply. We have to build more and there's more projects that need financed. I mean, these are all good things. I think the financing will come and the supply chain I think people are not talking about that as much, even though it's still a big issue. But I'm reading a lot of charts and reports these days showing that uh, we're built where there's like a huge manufacturing boom in this country and we're building out more uh, factories themselves. And, and we're so does that help? Yeah, so more factories helps, but you got to be building the right things in those factories. So if you think about transmission lines, it's cables, uh, it's towers. It's, you know, a lot of copper, if you would. And, um, you know, transmission is a very inefficient business. You lose a lot of energy. Once you send electricity, you know, about 600 miles, you've lost it. Uh, so crazy. you have to build these utilities, these generators near where your consumers are, or else it doesn't work. Now there's technology in the works that will allow you to dramatically improve that, but that's decades out. The other thing you can do is build your energy generation next to where it's going to be consumed. So it's called community power. So you think of a, you have a small town and that town then has its own solar farm. It has its own batteries and there's no high tension cables connecting it to the grid. It's consumed right then and there. And I think that's a trend you're going to see a lot more of, especially as we see more efficient solar uh, become prevalent, better battery technology, and eventually small modular nuclear reactors, which are very safe uh, and very efficient. I want to ask you, I want to ask you this. So I have a lot of friends in South Africa and what's affecting them right now is really sad for, you know, rich or poor, there's just rolling blackouts, you know, it's daily, it's, it's weekly, monthly. And for those who don't understand, it's like, imagine living and a lot of people already not in their head listening to this, who are living with this right now in other parts of the world. Uh, I guess I take this for granted here in the US, but you have like four to eight hours and they announce it in advance, at least over there, where in some countries they don't, but they just simply don't have power. And you have to yep. drive, if you need to like work, you drive to a Starbucks or whatever in another county or something and you can see the maps. And it's like really an annoying thing to live by. A lot of wealthier people have generators and stuff, but the problem is there's no gas, there's no fuel. People have solar, but like you said, the supply chain is many years out. There's no parts, there's no supply. I, you're probably like reading the newspaper in the morning. I don't know if you flip through like the actual paper. I do on the on the on the plane for some reason. Do you do you like think about is there anything you can do to help help them there? Do do something. Well, I, the challenge in South Africa, and I was just there in March, um, is their electrical infrastructure hasn't been maintained, and so it's falling apart bit by bit, and so they have to do load shedding, as it's called there, where they shut down the power for hours at a time. And so hotels uh, and businesses all have generators. And to your point, um, they're running short of fuel. The other problem is when you're running all these generators, they are huge pollutants. Now you're seeing some, oh, yeah. some very environmentally focused folks and, the, and generally speaking, people in South Africa are very environmentally focused. 
uh, that are building large solar farms. Um, I was uh, at one place where they had built a three megawatt solar farm with batteries. So they were completely off grid. They were just totally independent of the grid. Now that requires a lot of capital. And so that's the other challenge. Um, but you're seeing, for example, in Kenya, you have huge amounts of potential geothermal energy because they have all this volcanic activity mm. near the Rift Valley, um, which could be harnessed very inexpensively. The problem is, how do you get that energy from Kenya to South Africa, for example? And you can't transmit it. A lot farther than so, 600 miles. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a, a, an issue. And, uh, you know, Bitcoin solves part of that by being able to convert all that energy into a monetary store of value that then you can convert back into energy that's what I'm somewhere thinking. else. Can you do that? Yeah, so, so that's that's a way to do it. The challenge is, as you mentioned, the supply chain issues in South Africa, you know, you got to get the, uh, the generators or the solar farms, you got to get the batteries, you got to get all that stuff there so that you can um, take the Bitcoin you generate somewhere else, use it to fund that, but you still have a supply chain challenge. So it, it, it will get solved over time. Um, and I a, think people are very inge ingenious and they're, they're yeah. innovative and they'll figure it out. I heard that Cape Town is supposed to be fully solar in a, in a couple of years. Yep, absolutely. Which could be really interesting to see. Um, I alluded in the earlier part of the show about regulation, but your industry had uh its own regulatory roller coaster in the past couple of months there was supposed to be like the current administration was supposed to put out like a bitcoin mining tax or something is what's going on there is that is that all that still in the works no so the um senator warren and uh the democrats president biden uh were backing uh what was called the dame act which was essentially digital asset mining excise tax so applying a 30% excise tax on the energy used by Bitcoin miners to produce Bitcoin. Uh, it wasn't meant to raise money in reality. It was just meant to shut down Bitcoin mining in the US um, under the belief, false assumption, that if you shut down Bitcoin miners, there'll be more energy available to people and oh you won't God. have to turn on fossil fuel plants. And it, it, it gets into the circular argument about the fact that you know, Bitcoin miners don't cause more fossil fuel plants to get turned on. If anything, they cause more solar and wind farms to get built, which when they get turned on helps the environment. Bitcoin miners are predominantly over 50% users of renewable energy. We don't use fossil fuel. And uh, miners like ourselves are very focused on operating as much as possible behind the meter at renewable energy facilities because we want to help those facilities grow and be economically viable. Now, because ever... of the oh, yeah. debt ceiling discussions, that tax got tabled. And so uh, there's supposedly no new taxes for two years. We'll see what happens there if that gets resuscitated. But um... is I'm hoping that all of this symbolic legislation and these enforcement shots are just like the current administration's way to like plant their flag in what's going on leading up to the elections. I'm hoping that's what all this is, because I don't understand why my beloved United States is like becoming so anti what we spelled, what we spent the last decade building. Yeah, it's it's sad to see if you look back at how important the Internet was to the development of technology and what the U.S. Uh, really benefited from the development of the internet. Um, digital assets and uh, all the technology around it is a very similar field. And the US has decided to be more of a Luddite and shun it and allow other parts of the world to develop and uh, adopt proper regulation as opposed to being a leader in this space. So what's happening? Lots of companies are saying, well, you know, it's too risky to operate in the US, we'll move offshore. And so you see companies like Coinbase and others starting to establish operations, jurisdictions where there's much better regulatory frameworks. Uh, you know, Europe has adopted the Mika framework now, which will go live next year, uh, which provides some regulatory clarity on digital exchanges, et cetera. You have the UK is working on things. Hong Kong is starting to uh, open up and develop uh, regulatory frameworks. Singapore, uh, UAE is very advanced in the space. And so you're starting to see countries uh, develop an openness to this, and the U.S. is trying to go in the opposite direction. 
I think. Now, that being said, um, you know, companies like FTX and the shenanigans that went on there, uh, you know, that was a lot of bad stuff. And so that's why this has become so politicized now. It's kind of, uh, you know, the uh, Democrats uh, seem to be very focused on trying to be the, uh, the good person here and, and shutting down all this criminal activity. The problem yeah. is uh, they're doing it in a way that's really harming the overall industry. You guys, speaking of the industry, you guys put together like a, a half a million dollar pledge for Bitcoin core development. Thank you. Um, that's really awesome. Are you following developments on that? Are you following like BIP 300 or some of the, you know, the ordinal stuff that's been going on on top of Bitcoin? How do you see Bitcoin in the near future? So what we're starting to see now is uh, a continued adoption of Bitcoin, both uh, from a user perspective. So wallets with less than one Bitcoin in them. So think of it as people who hold less than $28,000 in Bitcoin are growing at a rapid rate, but also wallets with more than one Bitcoin in them are growing, which is tends to be higher net worth or institutional accounts. Um, so we see developers also starting to shift over to Bitcoin because A, it's the most secure network. It's the only truly fully decentralized network that's outside of any corporate control or government control. Um, and we're starting to see more and more development happen. Uh, you know, Obviously, Lightning is a layer two on top of Bitcoin, which facilitates you know, high velocity transactions at low cost. Ordinals is a another use case, though by the way ordinals work today by taking up actual block space means they compete with financial transactions for that yeah. block space, which is inefficient. And so I think what we're going to see is a lot more side chains and level two networks where people will develop these applications. You'll start seeing things like identity networks. You'll start seeing yes. uh, networks for uh, healthcare data. You'll start seeing networks for ownership of properties and title and things like that, uh, where it, all that will be recorded on a le level two or a side chain and then authenticated on the Bitcoin blockchain. It's kind of funny that two things happen. The, the demand and the competition of all of this other stuff on top of the Bitcoin main chain is causing the developers to finally, you know, uh, take things like BIP 300 seriously, where you can do side chains and layer twos and some of this other stuff, and where it's kind of like pushing them into needing to do it, which has been badly needed for a while. Uh, I think that's really, really cool. But at the same time, um, don't forget that a lot of these other blockchains were started because people wanted to do smart contracts and other uh, layer two. But a lot of this stuff started because the Bitcoin uh, blockchain got really, really uh, competitive and expensive back in like 2015 when things started to heat up again. And that's where like the block size wars came from. So now we're seeing like everyone wants to, what you just said, healthcare data, insurance products, you know, mortgage products, all these different things. People want to build them on Bitcoin. They want to build them on the most secure network in the world. Are you kind of feeling that same thing? Absolutely. And uh, we're doing some development work in the area of side chains and other technologies to help build that infrastructure. You know, we're big believers in that we're not just a mining company, we're also a technology company. We have a fully integrated technology stack from our pool software orchestration layer, firmware that runs in miners, uh, controller boards and immersion technology that we're co-developing with other partners. So we're also developing areas around side chains and the infrastructure to build these things. We think that the more we can do to build the ecosystem and build the infrastructure so it's easy for people to develop things, the faster adoption will happen. As adoption accelerates, there'll be more transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain, transaction fees will grow, and miners will have a revenue stream well beyond the um, rewards we get from uh, from just mining from the blockchain. Uh, you just you just reminded me of some of question I wanted to ask you about software. Are you guys running stratum version two uh we're working to incorporate stratum two into our pool and our miners you know again because we're vertically integrated in a way like apple is um we have the ability to adopt that very quickly because we run our own firmware in the miners we operate our own pool so it's easy for us to do that but yes definitely stratum two we think is a very important um technology man it's crazy like all these years later the uptime 
on on the Bitcoin blockchain. It really makes me proud uh, for 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 where we are today and how much we've grown. It's just I don't understand the whole Binance Coinbase situation going on right now. I don't understand what the SEC is doing. I'm so lost. Yeah, I, I think the you have to separate kind of uh, the enforcement the SEC is doing around true kind of um, activity that was focused on skirting laws or rules and that may be dangerous to investors and consumers versus um, the fact that uh, there wasn't a set of clear or there aren't a set of clear rules regarding certain tokens and are they securities and not and whether companies offering those are in violation of the law or not. Uh, you have to kind of separate those two into mm. different buckets. And again, this gets back to the blowback around FTX, right? What is real kind of criminal activity, fraud, et cetera? And what is lack of regulatory clarity that causes companies to operate in a gray area until regulation exists? And I think the market structure um, law that is being proposed in the House of Representatives is a great first step. Uh, I think it's encouraging that the Democrats are engaging with the Republicans who have uh, put forth that bill in negotiating it. And I think we'll start, we'll see uh, a revised version of that be submitted here uh, to Congress, uh, to the House of Representatives shortly. And then we'll have to see how the Senate kind of takes the bill up. But the fact that uh, Congress is actively working on it means that, uh, you know, this may have an impact on these uh, enforcement actions that the SEC is doing because the SEC is kind of acting uh, as an enforcer without a clear set of guidelines, if you would, from Congress, other than the old original laws around securities, which date, you know, almost a hunt from almost a hundred years ago and aren't yeah. really applicable. Yeah. It's like, they're just follow. They're just fo So the new laws have to be passed. I'm just, I'm excited, but I don't like to get too hopeful because I've seen these things come out so many times and nothing and nothing comes of it. So, yep. so we'll see what happens. It's really cool that you see yourself as a steward of the industry uh, because a lot of people will look at large Bitcoin mining pools as like try to look at centralized power, but here you are implementing software that decentralizes power. And it's almost like your incentive is to have Bitcoin as decentralized and have as much integrity as possible as your financial business model. Like that's your model for it to have as much integrity as possible as a system. Well, absolutely. Because if, the system has full integrity, people will trust it. And, uh, you know, the difference between faith and trust is, you know, faith, you just believe something, but you have no proof that it's actually true. Uh, trust means you have faith, plus you've actually seen proof that it's true. So if people can trust the Bitcoin blockchain and its integrity and all of the technologies related to it, then people will develop things on top of it and it'll flourish. You know, I think if you look at Ethereum, one of the challenges there is it's highly centralized from a control perspective. You know, if Vitalik says ABC, then that's predominantly what's going to happen. Um, and you have the Ethereum Foundation then. Mm. And so you also have, um, you know, some issues that have occurred more recently with Ethereum where you've had some outages, uh, which, you know, yes. no base layer network should have an outage ever. Um, Bitcoin certainly hasn't had them. And then you also have uh, because of the complexity of Ethereum, you know, what makes it attractive to developers is that you can program it. What makes it complicated to operate is you can program it. And that adds security risks and all sorts of other risks. Uh, if you think about the internet, it's a very simple protocol. It's based on TCP IP, period. And, and then you have other protocols that run on top of that as layer twos. You know, you have email, for example, file transfer, HTML. All these are protocols that run at layers above the TCP IP layer. Bitcoin is like the internet. It's a basic technology that's very simple and I'm not trying to in any way dumb it down. No. Just saying it is, it serves one purpose, right? Um, and it's not programmable, but you can do all of that programmability at layers above it. And I think that's why people are now finally starting to move forward. You know, Taproot was a big move in enabling next generation kind of applications on Bitcoin. And, you know, whether it's BIP 300 or others, I think we're going to continue to see, uh, you know, really good development. Um, Why? Like you like you mentioned, you know, we, we did this uh, grant to the core developers. Um, and that was really important for us because, uh, you know, the core developers, they really are there volunteering their services. And, um, 
know, it's very important that we support them as much as possible so that we can ensure, A, the integrity of the Bitcoin network, but more importantly, that it continues to advance and innovate. I remember I tell you a funny story. Um, so the year is 2012 and I'm sitting, or 2011, and I'm sitting with Gavin in a cafe in Austria. And I was like 21 years old. And um, uh, um, Gavin Andreessen, who the uh, Satoshi passed the keys off to uh, at the time was the, the Bitcoin core maintainer. And um, for, for a couple of years, and I remember we're sitting across and he's like, Charlie, I need to get paid. <laughs> yeah. And so that's why we founded the Bitcoin Foundation, actually. Uh, and at the same time, why we founded it is why we realized very quickly that that Bitcoin has no use for a foundation uh, type of type of thing. But essentially, originally, the idea was to like bring advertising dollars together because the companies that existed at the time were just like my company, BitInstant, Mt. Gox, the some, you know, the Bitcoin miners, you had Slush Pool and you had um, a few other companies and you had Rogers memory dealers. And we're like, we need to start buying billboards about Bitcoin and we need to pay these developers just in grants to continue maintaining the software. And uh, it felt like a very purist thing. But over time, uh, as Bitcoin grew, uh, there was like a general pushback against like a centralized entity. And I'm really happy for that because now you mentioned with Ethereum Foundation, that's the biggest problem is that you have when you have, it's not about even how much control they have. Cause a lot of people are going to write me emails and say, Oh, you know, the, the, the developers have all the control in Ethereum and proof of stake and yada, yada, yada. It's like, I know, I know, I know more than, you know, trust me. But the problem is, is that the perception, when you have a perception of a leader or a founder or a centralized entity, it loses that like decentralization. It also creates someone that they can go after. Satoshi yep. leaving was one of the best things that he could ever, the best gift that he could ever do for us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, that's what makes Bitcoin very unique. I think it, it's much more uh, altruistic in its origins than a, a lot of these other networks, which are designed as businesses. And you, know, you go back to the internet, it was free. So there was no economic model in owning the internet other than yeah. the government wanted to control it. Um, you know, Bitcoin is a bit like that as well. You, uh, I'm exciting myself here because I don't often get to talk about Bitcoin these days in, in, in deep, you know, we're not even like deep, but just more like the altruistic, exciting part um, with someone who knows this is a really refreshing conversation. Um, this weekend, I was, at, I was telling you earlier, I was at this like um, financial summit type thing, just like a gathering of 20 or 30 people with my friend, John Najeri, and he has this company, Market, Market Rebellion. And, um, and um, I was giving this very passionate talk about Bitcoin because it's all I know and love other than Bitcoin, my wife and my dog. And um, a guy walked over to me and he said, you know, it was really nice to hear someone speak so passionately, positively about Bitcoin, because all I hear lately about Bitcoin and crypto is so negative. And it literally made me want to go and cry because he was right. It's been so negative lately. There, other than me and some other holdouts, it's just been all negative. And, and so like, this has been a very refreshing conversation. Thank you. You guys are investing in a lot of stuff too, which has been really great. I just I just read a list. Thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. No, we, we think the uh, you know the industry needs uh, needs help, and so we're very focused on investing in everything from ASIC development down at the hardware layer all the way up through the software stack and and into the application layer. So we think the more we can do to kind of foment good ecosystem, the better, you know, and companies like Intel, Microsoft, Apple, all have done that to develop their ecosystems. And we think that, you know, the Bitcoin miners um, really have a responsibility to help do that. You guys are developing software to make it more efficient to mine Bitcoin. I'm, I'm reading um, at the same time, ASIC development has gone, gone a long way, further decentralization for Bitcoin. So we've tackled the environmental concern. Is there any, any other like, Bitcoin centralization attacks that you hear people are pointing to like, oh, only a few pools can control Bitcoin. But like, what do you say to that? Well, I think uh, when you look at the pool issue, um, 
one of the reasons we run our own pool is uh, we want to be fully in control of our own kind of stack, if you would, because we can optimize it to operate most efficiently that way. But more importantly, we don't want to be uh, under somebody else's control. Now, Stratum 2 that you mentioned earlier is a technology that will enable miners to become more in control, take back control from pools. Mm. And our pool doesn't have any third-party miners. It's only us. So uh, Stratum 2 for us is more of a technology enhancement around efficiency. But for miners who are mining on third-party pools, it adds, it gives them their power back, if you would, um, no pun intended, um, Yeah. to take control of uh, their hash rate. And so I think it's really important for the industry uh, you know, as we see this kind of concentration of uh, mining pools, um, you know, in some cases, some pools have over 30% uh, of the network hash rate. And we, you know, personally think that uh, there's risk there. Um, you know, there were some issues with Poolin's pool, for example, last year yeah. or the year before. So, you know, we, we think this is, Stratum 2 is going to be a very important part of continuing to decentralize the Bitcoin network. Do you, do you ever envision a world where you can't mine Bitcoin in the United States anymore? Um, it's something we're thinking about always. You know, we're constantly focused on resilience. The bigger of a mining operation we have, the bigger risks we have. The, and so we're very focused on expanding globally um, at the same time as we're expanding in the U.S. So our goal longer term is to be 50% outside of the U.S., 50% in the U.S., because we think... Um, it has all sorts of prudent reasons. One is there are different climates in different hemispheres of the planet. So yeah. you can find cooler temperatures when it's warmer in the U.S. in the Southern Hemisphere. There's plenty of renewable energy that's stranded and hasn't been developed yet in places like Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Kenya, that, like you were just saying too, yeah. Yeah. So we, you know, as you keep seeing this industry develop, I think you'll start seeing Bitcoin miners actually focus on owning and investing in power generation. Uh, you know, we're very focused also on looking at methane uh, emissions from landfills and being able to mine using those gases because methane is 80 times more damaging to the environment than carbon dioxide. And so if we can use methane uh, as an energy source for our Bitcoin mines, we're actually helping the environment. And at the same time, we're providing a revenue stream for landfills so they can continue to improve the ecological aspects of what they're doing so that you don't have all of this yeah. uh, trash leaching into groundwater and things like that. Are you are you able to pay your vendors in Bitcoin for this? Are you able to create this circular economy using Bitcoin? Um, yeah, I, I think it's difficult at kind of industrial scale because the counterparties worry about the volatility in the in the price of Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin of late has been showing very little volatility, and it's actually the risk-adjusted return of Bitcoin uh, because the decrease in volatility has become much more attractive for people because uh, the risk of volatility has gone oh, down. Oh, interesting. So people, yeah. you saying people buying it or like wanting to mine it? Well, it's people wanting to hold it as an asset. And so uh, if you say that it, again, you think that the risk adjusted. So the risk adjusted return on an asset is basically how much is it? What's your return on investment uh, weighed against the risk of volatility? And so if something is highly volatile, but has a huge return, then it's risk adjusted return may be uh, attractive. Now, Bitcoin, because its volatility has decreased, if you look over the past five years, there is no asset that has had a better risk-adjusted return than Bitcoin. It's one of them by a long shot. And you know, right. Michael Saylor talks a lot about this. Other people talk a lot about this. But um, Bitcoin is becoming um, more stable. Now, the benefit there is it then becomes more attractive to institutional investors and um, you know, business users. But I, I think we have a ways to go yet before in the U.S. we'll start seeing circular Bitcoin economies develop. What do we need to get to where we saw like year over year growth of the Bitcoin price at like, like what would be a great, like a 7% price? Like what would you like to see that creates like a stability, but also a good investment class, like real estate or like a bond or something? Right. So um, that number, do you think? Yeah, I, you, we have to think of it this way. The, the having happens every four years. So you have to essentially double the price of Bitcoin every four years, given your energy costs are constant. 
Plus, you have to then layer in the fact that the global hash rate's increasing along the way as well, which increases the cost to mine Bitcoin. So the the you know the mining industry needs to get transaction fees increasing to maintain its viability long term beyond not this having but the having beyond that i think um but that doesn't affect users of bitcoin it affects miners do you uh you ever think everyone thinks that satoshi was some sort of mathematician or whatever do you ever think satoshi was maybe some sort of like engineer or or something in the energy field instead because the 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 creating of like a monetary unit that that tracks the cost of decentralized global energy in real time this is that is the invention in and of itself yeah i i I don't know i think satoshi may have been one or many people uh may have been a team effort it's hard to say but regardless it's an amazing thing it really is. It's so cool. They, I really appreciate it. And there you have it, everyone. Another, yeah. probably one of an amazing eye-opening episode of the Charlie Shrem Show. A huge thank you, huge, huge thank you to our bolding and candid guest, Fred Teal. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you so much to my valued listeners for tuning in. We continue to push boundaries every single day and challenge the norms because we believe in the power of conversation, Bitcoin and crypto and its ability to spark change. It's the only way we can make changes by continuing to talk about these things and correcting the wrongs and, and you know, exploding the rights. If you found value in today's episode, please subscribe to the show. Please leave us a review. Your feedback fuels the show. It helps us bring us more amazing guests. Follow us on Twitter. Twitter. Remember, keep asking questions. I'm Charlie Shrem signing off. Keep challenging the status quo.